I'm going to um, introduce our next, our next speaker now, um, Dr. Kevin Mansfield, um, who will be presenting um, a, his paper about architectural lighting design. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are today celebrating the 50th anniversary of lighting research and technology. Architectural developments have been immense over these years, and there's been a corresponding meteoric rise in lighting technology, much lighting applications research over those 50 years. As we celebrate those 50 years, we might ask, what developments in architecture have there been? How has the nature of the treatment of daylight in buildings changed? What has been the impact of new lighting technologies? And what lighting applications research has been undertaken over that time? Well, I was born in 1956, and although I was not reading the first issue of Lighting Research and Technology in 1969, my taste ran more to the Marvel comics and look and learn in those days. In many respects, my career in lighting has just about run in parallel with the 50 years of LR&T. So when the editorial board of LR&T invited me to contribute to a special issue of the journal, well, I was very keen to take part. Um, my paper is in the special issue, and first I was keen to sketch the incredible developments in architecture that have occurred. And secondly, I wanted to celebrate the contribution that lighting researchers had made to thinking about the lit environment and how it may be arranged. Two things stood out for me after I'd completed this work. First, that I had met most of these researchers, or if not met, I knew of them through older colleagues. And second, that the mapping or the correspondence between the interests of architects over those decades and the interests of lighting researchers over that same period was a little patchy, and I wondered why that might be. Well, we are shapers of our environment, the built environment. We design buildings that house activities for work, for transport, for display, and for the performance of visual tasks. Any architectural structure that we devise is bathed in daylight and sunlight, and such a structure acts as a filter or modulator of that light. The masons of the White Temple in Uruk, about 3000 BC, made a design decision when they placed brick upon brick bound together in mud to generate shadow from the incised projections in the harsh light of Mesopotamia. We also, on the exteriors and interiors of our buildings, install, mount, and scatter with abandon artificial light sources. Now, I'd, I'd like you to recall those early demonstrations where you zoom from the molecular scale to the astronomical scale and to all points in between. Let's define the scale of analysis over we, which we will explore. explore. Um, and this analysis is, is inspired by the work of the American designers Charles and Ray Eames in their famous film, Powers of Ten, which dates from 1977. What are the appropriate scales of analysis when looking or considering architectural lighting applications? Well, the, full, the, the smallest uh, object visible to the naked eye is around 100 micrometers, 1 to the 10 to the minus 4 on the left hand of the image there. For example, um, on the other hand, somewhere like the Grand Canyon on the right hand side is around 450 kilometers, 4.5 times 10 to the fifth meters. Now, I don't think we need to work at those uh, nano scales or those large scales. I'm suggesting we need to work at three scales that I've listed there the urban, the architectural, and the object scale. So, considering the human scale at the center of the diagram, Candidate ranges when exploring lighting applications, what we might call the urban, the architectural, and the object scales, would be 10 to the, th 10 to the 3 metres, 10 to the 1 metre, and 10 to the minus 1 metre, respectively of the order of 1,000 metres, 10 metres, and 10 centimetres. So for lighting specialists, of which there are many here represented today, the problem is how to advise architects and designers and engineers on the lighting of our cities, the urban scale, our squares and our plazas and our architectural interiors, the architectural scale, and the objects and the people that populate them, the object scale. 
The aim is to produce lit environments that are compelling, that are safe, that are pleasant, that are stimulating, that reveal and enhance architecture and contribute to our spiritual, physical and psychological well-being. This problem is intrinsically interesting and perhaps does not lend itself easily to over-analysis. Perhaps we may just revel in the happy, access, uh, the happy accident, such as the beauty of the corridors in the Collegio Terraziano by Antonio Gaudi, or the Baroque Vizkircha, shown here. Or a more recent example, the Bishop Edward Chapel by Niall McLaughlin Architects. But much as we can characterise the shuddering transition from the third movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony into the, into the finale as a change of key signature from E flat to C major, so there is some utility in defining what advice we might proffer at each of those scales of analysis, even if this advice is merely, to use a Buddhist phrase, a finger pointing at the moon. Well, what do I suggest? Well, I suggest you heed the words of the great lighting theorist, Joe Lyons, who is with us today. And it's a great pleasure to be able to see him in the audience today. Here's what Joe wrote in 1983. A good lighting engineer will determine afresh for each project what character the lighted space should express. Photometric criteria then take their rightful place as tools for defining and achieving the appropriate pattern of light and shade. Essentially, I take Joe's meaning as urging us to consider a lighting com composition. Any creative designer, be they an architect, a lighting designer, an interior designer, or, or a lighting artist, would deliver a lighting concept through a composition. Joe's quote referred to a lighted space. We now have a far larger canvas to work on as lighting practitioners from the urban to the architectural, to the object scale, as I have indicated. And note that as it is a composition of necessity, a composition depends upon a viewpoint. In the quote, there, there is also a reference to the appropriate pattern of light and shade. Neurophysiologically, in the words of David, David Hubel's famous book, black is as real to us as white. <coughs> so at the urban scale, we might consider the city of Lisbon along a frontage of about 8 kilometres, 8 times 10 to the 3 metres. Note that this picture is taken from a, a significant viewpoint. In terms of composition, we would advise control of brightness relationships, bearing in mind the district brightness context. We would also advise exploring hue relationships in terms of colour with particular attention paid to saturation. And we would seek to reinforce the sense of perspective in the scene by giving depth to the structure, the morphology, if you will, of the city. Let's now move to the architectural scale. Here is a plaza, the Plaza de Caicedo in Colombia, about 50 metres square, five times 10 to the one metres. This is a high level view. More typically, we, we would experience this on the ground. Here it is important to define the boundaries of the plaza, and this could be characterised by luminance criteria. It would also be important to reveal appropriately people and objects in the plaza with reference to appropriate colour rendering indices and modelling indices. I mentioned that this was a high level view. If you want to construct <coughs> such a view, here is what Wardrum was suggested in volume 14 in his wonderful, his magisterial perspective, manual on perspective in lighting research and technology. Still staying at the architectural scale, let's consider the Golden Hall in Athens here, a shopping centre about 70 metres square, <coughs> seven times 10 metres. This is a large interior room compared to the plaza just now, which was a large exterior room. We could perhaps reduce significant viewpoints with this, in this space to two, a major axis and the other a minor axis, perpendicular to the major. This always seemed to me one of the insights that my uh, late colleague Ted Rowlands made when developing CIBSE Technical Ma Memorandum 10. The sense that you could distill views in a space or a room crosswise and endwise with respect to 
a regular array of luminaires when assessing glare sensation. So much of architecture be, can be defined by significant visual axes which can be composed in lighting terms. So in terms of composition in a space such as this, the boundaries of the space will need to be defined by lighting and the people and objects that traverse the space will need to be rendered and modelled appropriately. And my final scale of analysis is the objects scale here, shown in this black basalt head in the Victoria and Albert Museum, about 30 to 40 centimetres across, 3 to 4 times 10 to the 1 metre. Here the object needs to be set against its background and the lighting arranged so that the details, the colour and the texture are revealed to convey the character and materials qualities of the object, all the while considering the conservation requirements of the object. Let me remind you of this second part of Joe's statement. Photometric criteria then take their rightful place as tools for defining and achieving the appropriate pattern of light and shade. Note the emphasis here on photometric criteria being <coughs> tools. And over the past 50 years of the history of lighting research and technology, a whole suite of tools have been developed by various members of the lighting community. Note also the emphasis on rightful place suggesting that photometric criteria and tools are subordinate to the composition, the lighting composition. So let's return to our urban architectural and object classi classifications. And here, in the urban context, is a view of the Potsdamer Platz in Berlin from 1992, a wasteland on the line between east and west. Urban planners were challenged to build a new city centre in the middle of a fully developed urban structure. Signature architects, including Renzo Piano, Norman Foster and Helmut Jahn, designed individual office towers to revitalise Berlin within the context of, a, of, a, of an overall lighting plan. The point here is that towns and cities either evolve incrementally, such as the example of Lis Lisbon that I showed earlier, or their subject, as in this case, to wholesale regeneration. And both of these development mechanisms have an impact on how the lighting is arranged. Let us return to our view of the city of Lisbon from across the River Tagus. We want to comprehend or make sense of the urban grain and we want to be held by the setting and be attracted to explore the setting as well. The lighting of the city can do that. So we need to understand the morphology of the city, uh, the, cognitive, the cognitive map of the city, if you will. Um, uh, and such a map was, was developed in the 1960s uh, by the still influential work of Kevin Lynch, a city being composed of five elements. And here, Diana Del Negro, in her doctoral work from 2015, distilled the Lynchian elements of the city. Landmarks, prominent elements that are recognised as such. Nodes where routes intersect and overlap. Paths, lines which connect places, they could be nodes or they could be landmarks. Edges, linear breaks in continuity, such as walls or shore lines or uh, railway lines. And then districts, medium to large sections of the city of identifiable character. Surely our approach must be then to identify elements within the city and then use our lighting expertise to reinforce these characteristics to promote legibility of the city. So I'm going to take my life in my hands and move backwards now. So if we go back to our <coughs> view of Lisbon. So here, the control of luminance contrast and colour contrast is paramount here. In this example, the Lynchian district in the top right of the slide seems harmoniously defined in a warm colour. And the landmark at the top left has the appropriate luminous contrast against the background to emphasise its significance in the urban vista. Yet the luminance and colour contrast in the foreground seem uncontrolled and patchy. And I suggest probably need the services of the lighting de designer. 
And in fact, uh, the student work that I mentioned, the student thesis I mentioned, uh, she is actually the chief lighting engineer of Lisbon. So I shall be on the email to, <laughs> to advise. <coughs> Now let's move to the architectural scale, the exterior architectural scale and the interior architectural scale. What happens when we move to these scales? Well, Kaplan has identified the dimensions of appraisal. There is, in blue, an immediate effect and an inferred or predicted effect. And this is along two dimensions, the dimension of understanding and the, uh, the dimension of exploration. Now what do those two domains mean? Well, understanding is comprehending or making sense of a scene. And exploration is being held by the setting, being attracted or pulled towards sources of additional information. If we look at, then at the details of the matrix, two components have been found to be effective predictors of environmental preference. Two of them, I suggest, are self-explanatory. We like things to be coherent. Coherence. We like things, we want to be able to infer or predict a degree of mystery within the environment. So to be attracted to explore that. We also, in the top right here, we need a degree of complexity in our environments. The, the human mind needs to be engaged, needs to be stimulated. But notice that it, the word is complexity, it's not chaos. We don't need to tip over into a busy <coughs> chaos. And then what about that term legibility? Legibility is the inference that being able to predict and maintain orientation will be possible as one wanders more deeply into the scene. And so spatial definition, an implicit aspect of legibility, has been found to be an important factor in preference. And so this is an obvious value when considering the definition of architectural spaces and architectural boundaries using light. <coughs> In fact, as early as 1954, Waldemar had articulated this sort of schema in his influential 1954 work, Studies in Interior Lighting. Excuse the rather poor image here, but the important point is that the, the, the dividing line here, either side of the yellow line, on the left is the gross apparent brightness pattern on boundary surfaces, those which define architectural volume. And on the right is the detailed luminance pattern, or the detailed apparent brightness pattern, which contribute both to the modelling of people and objects set in front of the surfaces and the modelling or space of the volume itself. And I see parallels now if you see the, a, a video game creator, um, in that they set the background and environment, don't they? The gross apparent brightness pattern on your screen. And then they have objects and people moving in, in, in front of that. Uh, sprites, if you will. So by the early 1990s, Lowe and Rowlands and me as their research assistant were re recommending that it was important for lighting designers to create a meaningful light pattern. From their research studies, they had isolated two independent factors which they called visual interest and visual lightness. And they had suggested average luminance recommendations and maximum to minimum luminance recommendations to overcome gloomy and dull visual environments. By 2000, Peter Stone was welcoming research by Lowe and his colleagues that seemed not only to support the spirit of it, but also to bring closer to reality Hopkinson's proposals for a code of lighting based on luminance. By 2004, Kit Cuttle was contending that Waldrum's design appearance method, you know, very much based on this scheme that I show here, was as, re as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. And Cuttle urged the designer to develop a hierarchy of illuminance, visual emphasis based on illuminance ratios in a method developed by Joe Lyons. This obviated the need for referring to luminous brightness scales, which were de bedeviled by having to estimate adaptation luminance. And now, as has been alluded to as we reach the present day, uh, Cuttle is now proposing a design procedure based on mean room surface exitance and target ambient illuminance ratio. These two metrics relate to two lighting design criteria. The first is perceived adequacy of illumination, the level of illumination that is just, just sufficient to make a space appear acceptably bright, 
to the activity of the houses, and secondly, illumination hierarchy, the distribution of illumination to express the visual significance of the activities or the contents of spaces. But what of the objects or people that are set in front of these boundary surfaces? As early as 1971, Cutland had argued for designers to, to use the illumination vector and the vector scalar ratio for specifying the directional quality of the lighting. And this chart, based on his researches, was suggested for normal design purposes. And you can see the natures of the recommendations that it makes. So vector scalar ratio is in the, in the, uh, um, in the middle of the diagram and an indication of the flow of light from weak to noticeably strong is shown in the left-hand panel, and possible lighting application areas are shown in the right-hand panel. So let us return to our architectural scale, our plaza, the, um, the, uh, the Plaza de Caixido in Colombia, our example of an architectural scale exterior. Here we want to understand the architecture that defines the squares and uh, the square and be attracted to safe exits from the plaza and not to be deterred from going down certain routes. The lighting of the plaza can do that. So what I'm suggesting is that we can control the luminance of the boundary surfaces to, propose, to promote legibility in Kaplan's terms and encourage people to explore the exits from the plaza, being attracted or pulled towards sources of additional information. But this, this uh, arrangement can be compromised by the increasing use of luminous media screens in our exterior environments. Someone mentioned Marsden's 71 paper. I'm also going to mention Marsden's 71 paper, which is, is really worth reading if you haven't come across it before. He'd suggested in a study in 1971 that complex luminance fields uh, it, uh, in a study of complex luminance fields, that strongly coloured surfaces were liable to be undervalued and self-luminous elements were liable to be overvalued. Now, Caspar Nielsen made some measurements in Times Square in 2008. They're instructive. In such a zone in the UK, what we might call a high district brightness area, the maximum recommended luminance would be of the order of 150 candles per square metre. <coughs> In Casper's measurements, 40% of the screens had luminances between 1,000 and 2,000 candelas per square metre, while 30% of the screens were between 3,000 and 5,000 candelas per square metre. I hope you can see the potential for the disruption of legibility within urban spaces when confronted by such self-luminous sources. Our example of the architectural interior, uh, architectural scale interior, was the Golden Hall shopping centre in Athens. In the interior space, be it retail or leisure or workspace, we want to understand the architecture of the space and be encouraged to explore it. Lighting can dramatically contribute to this. The importance of luminance contrast is demonstrated in the measurement and survey of the Golden Hall shopping centre by Catherine Georgiulia. The left image here shows the bottom of the atrium at 12 noon, where retail workers reported <coughs> lighting conditions being uncomfortable and too dim because of the marked luminance contrast, whereas conditions in the right image were much more comfortable at 5 p.m. when the luminance contrast in the artificially lit situation was less marked. Within the architectural scale environment, what about the objects or people moving in front of the boundary surfaces in this environment? Essentially, these people are cutting or intersecting complex light fields produced by the interaction of light with architectural volumes and surfaces. Again, Cuttle has suggested that we can deconstruct such complex light fields into the following components. A matte white surface that shows diffuse light, a glossy black surface that distinguishes highlights, a gnome one on a base which shows vector direction, and a faceted object to show directionality. Now, Sarah Rodriguez, in her doctoral studies of 2011, actually made some couple-type objects. And here, 
she is using the technique to characterise the lighting of some contemporary buildings in Portugal. So you can see that you've got the facet object, the, 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 the glossy object, the gnomon on a base, and the diffuse white uh, cone at the top of the, um, uh, the, top of the image. And notice how effectively the, 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 the light pattern and the flow of light within the space is, is, is deconstructed by the use of these, these, the, these objects. And look at the vector direction, look at the strength of the highlights, look at how, how diffuse uh, this element is on the, in this right-hand picture compared to the left-hand top leaf environment. Whereas you would expect the flow of light in this space to actually be much more mild than the, than the deconstructing objects actually reveal. Now the current lighting guide of the SLL for offices now makes these recommendations. One of them is that the modelling ratio between the task area illuminance and cylindrical illuminance should be between about 0.3 and 0.6. And presumably, this means the ratio EC to EH, um, 150 over 300 is about 0 0.5, and 150 over 500 is about 0 0.3. Now, I've never seen cylindrical illuminance used like this. Traditionally, cylindrical illuminance has been related to giving an indication of the ambient lightness within a room. The terminology modelling ratio used here is confusing for the designer, as this conflicts with the modelling ratio that was defined by Cuttle and lines in, 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 in earlier times, the vector scalar ratio. In my opinion, a true indicator of the direct to diffuse ratio. I feel really the inspection of the illumination vector and calculation of the vector to scalar ratio is still a very powerful technique to characterize the modeling of people and objects within the space. And I would urge you as lighting practitioners to revisit it. I've really been talking about lighting static scenes up to now, but with the rise of dynamic lighting and the possibilities of ultimate lighting control, this brings a new set of issues for the lighting designer to address. Now, Don Kim, who also is here in his doctoral studies recently completed this year, invited professional lighting designers to design five lively lighting schemes and five relaxing lighting schemes <coughs> using a kit of lighting pens. Here is an example of a lively lighting scheme. The dynamic components of this lively lighting scheme are the ceiling luminaires that are programmed to change from 4,000 to 6,500K in a 20 minute slow loop. The LED luminous wall that you can see in the centre of the photograph, programmed to change from cyan to blue in a five minute loop. And the pendant lamps at the top there a program to change from 4,000 to 6,500k in a 20 minute slow loop. That may be a lively design, but it would actually give me a headache, I think. <laughs> and here is, the, is an example of one of the relaxing schemes. The dynamic component of the relaxing setting is the LED luminous wall here, programmed to change from a saturated yellow to neutral while in a five minute loop. Now, what Dong used was a, a self-reported Russell-type effect grid, um, which is defined by two psychological dimensions, an activation dimension here and a, a pleasantness dimension uh, going across the page. And you can see that his lively and uh, relaxing settings, L5 and R4, um, uh, are designed, have been designed to stay on the right side of pleasantness while still generating a lively and relaxing ambience. <coughs> Finally, our object, the, uh, the basalt sculpture from the Victoria and Albert Museum. When viewing an object, we need to appreciate the texture, the form and colour to understand the object and be given perceptual information to engage with the object. Again, lighting can be a powerful force for doing this. We refer to some measurements by Matthew Grant looking at this uh, black basalt sculpture. Uh, the viewing distance is half a metre. An extensive set of luminance measurements was made as shown in blue on the image. In summary, the average object luminance was just over a candelus per square metre and the average field luminance about eight candelus per square metre, giving a uh, field of view to object luminance ratio of about eight to one. 
we can predict from the earlier findings of Lowe and his colleagues that viewers would assess these conditions as dim and uninteresting. And in fact, the assessment data of the group of observers collected by Grant was that the object was unclear, hazy, and with reflections. Further evidence, I suggest, for the utility of luminance ratio. So there we have examples of lighting being able to deployed, be deployed at the scale of cities, in exterior architectural plazas, in interior architectural spaces, and the display of objects. The ability of the architect or the lighting designer to manipulate light in this way has a profound effect in creating engaging, exciting, pleasant or somber environments. And the process by which this is undertaken has been reflected in the papers published over the long history of lighting research and technology. And the lighting design approaches and application techniques that have been suggested have mirrored the architectural developments of the time. So for example, from the 1950s to the 1960s, Designing for daylight was given, import, was given importance. <coughs> James Sterling and his signature buildings at the University of Leicester in 64 and the University of Cambridge History Faculty in 1968 was exploring neo-constructivist <coughs> architectural forms employing standard industrial glazing, brick and tile, still admired by, by many people in spite of their technical problems. The concern of the lighting research community at the time was an environmental approach. And it seems strange that lighting researchers at the time were looking at the effects of small window areas and creating windowless environments when Sterling himself was remarking at the time, glass buildings are appropriate in the English climate. By 1976, Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers at the Centre Pompidou in Paris had redefined <coughs> what a museum gallery could be with a bold expression of mechanical services on the exterior. And in the Lloyds building, dating from 1978 to 1986, Rogers reversed the traditional pattern, exposing the service exoskeleton on the outside. This allowed an uninterrupted office for it. Jean Nouvel at L'Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, 1981 onwards, demonstrated how a facade could dynamically respond to, to a change in environment by the use of motorized iris-like shutters. For lighting researchers, energy saving was important. Exploring <coughs> the opportunity to ex displace electric light with daylighting and trying to reduce overall lighting levels by controlling contrast or providing local lighting. By the late 1990s, uh, Geary had designed the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao with the sculptural effect of daylight and sunlight on the curvilinear forms. The distinctive grey titanium panels have been designed using software from the aerospace industry. And we know Foster's and Partners' iconic gherkin, the Swiss Ray building, the triangulated glass skin is in a sense generated by com computation, is essential, essentially the built reality of an algorithm. By this time, lighting researchers had developed an enthusiasm for the prospects of employing advanced software for visualisation but little agreement on whether you could be creating harmonious luminous patterns or revealing form using vector methods. As we move to current times, the trend now is for huge urban master plans overseen by one architect with other specialists contributing. Examples of the work of MR, RDV in Lyon and huge urban developments in China, for example, the Lingan New City near Shanghai. Now here, when Kuhl has his CCTV headquarters in Beijing, it's so huge that it's almost a city in itself. For lighting researchers, there is interest in circadian lighting to encourage sufficient light to promote circadian stimulation and the use of light to, prom to promote brand. A brand is now promoted through its buildings, but also through its logo, its website and its Facebook page. Lighting design is being exhorted to move towards the third stage of the lighting profession. When I went to Lux Europa in Berlin, there used to be a glass sculpture that started, as you, your time ended, started to glow malevolently in the corner. We don't have one here to, at the moment, but my time is up. So I just want to finish by saying it's to the great credit of all those practitioners and researchers featured in the pages of Lighting Research and Technology that they have maintained enthusiasm for exploring the interaction of light, people and architecture. 
My sense is that architects are still primarily motiv motivated by daylight and increasingly more formal considerations of architectural typology and regard the provision of artificial lighting as a slightly tiresome necessity. This perhaps explains why, in the survey of architectural drivers presented here, the relationship with lighting research and application appears hazy. It seems clear that in the early years of lighting research and technology, in keeping with the social concerns of the time, great store was set by the contribution that environmental science could make to the provision of comfortable, engaging environments, which was perhaps lost in later years. However, the current ongoing research into non-image forming aspects of light now offers the enticing prospect of incorporating such findings into the design of contemporary buildings and perhaps acts as a counterpoint to lighting design based primarily on visual appearance. Thank you very much. <laughs>